I want to start with a moment of honesty. Because in the world we live in today, attackers are winning. Banks, hospital, re retail companies, every sector in our economy is being hacked every day. And the names we see in this slide are just example for successful attacks published in the last four weeks. And there was nothing special last month. On the other hand, it's pretty clear that the world is becoming more and more digitalized. In only one generation, we moved from a society that was relying on computers for very specific tasks to a society that doing everything with computer. All of us, we walk in jobs that put us in front of the computers probably 80% of our time. But also, if you have a job that puts you on the field or in construction site or patrolling the city, Still, in those companies, the ratio between employees and computers is very close to one, and that doesn't even include cell phones. What it means is that tech surface is expanding. When we first had home PCs, computer viruses could destroy our operating system. Once we had the web and we created online businesses, we started losing money to attackers, both customers and businesses. When we start digitalizing our data and created much more digitalized data, hackers could get control of this data and steal both our intellectual property and personal information. Now, in 2010, when Stuxnet, Stuxnet was published by Kaspersky, we all realized that cyber attacks can have also physical impact. We also start calling them cyber, not just security hacks. Now, in the last few years, we realized that critical infrastructure is the target not only for government, governmental agencies. In the last couple of years, we see that the most sophisticated tools created by the NSA and the CIA are now publicly available. And people are using them for global attacks like WannaCry, NotPetya, or WannaMine. Now, if what this means is that our future is, looks like that our autonomous cars are gonna smash at each other, or our smart cities will shut down at once, or that identity theft will be common in a society that is spending half of the wake time on virtual reality, that sounds like a very dark future. But, let me be optimistic here. I don't think we are all doomed to fail. On the contrary, I think that we must win and we will win. And the reason I'm saying that is because as the cyber threat has a more significant risk on society, on technology, on innovation, the pressure to really solve the problem is increasing. And we see today, Cyberism is just a six years old company and we're not the only unicorn in the market. And new companies, new technology, they're using new technologies to solve this problem and the most significant one is using AI. And please allow me to spend the better half of my presentation in explaining what I mean. So we all understand we're gonna win, so that's great. Now, really to be able to win, the most important thing I think we need to understand, and I'm sure we all do, but I still want to note it specifically, is that attack operation is a complex thing for an attacker. Okay, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of expertise, and the attackers are always leaving in the dark because they never have all the information, all the intelligence that they need to move forward in their attack. If we understand that, we can really start thinking about our advantages as defenders. Now, as defender, what we really want to do is we want to prevent anyone from getting into our internal network. Because if an attacker cannot get in, there's not much damage he can do. But what I found surprising is that this is probably impossible. So my background in cybersecurity, or my career in cybersecurity, started uh, in the A200 unit of the Israeli Defense Force, where I spent a very good seven years, 
uh, leading a technological team that was part of cyber operations. And in every operation that I was involved in, we were able to get a hold on some asset in the internal network, 100% of the time. Sometimes it took us a day, and other times it was a longer process, it took us weeks or months, but eventually we got in, always. Now, we as defender, we need to decide where are we gonna invest? Are we gonna spend our time, money, and efforts on preventing what I just said is unpreventable? Or we're we gonna look at the entire attack landscape and try to see if there are more opportunities for us to stop an attack before any damage is done. Now, so far, we chose the first. We invested 80% of the time and money in trying to prevent the unpreventable. We built walls that will never be able to protect us, or will never be able to fully protect us. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't build walls. We should. But we always need to assume that someone someday will be able to bypass this wall above or below or find the loose bricks and hack in. Now, the reason we didn't invest 100% of our money in prevention is because we failed. And when we failed, we had to spend more money on understanding what the damage was and then recovering from it. We need to remember that our goal as defenders is to protect our organizations, not to prevent. If I'm unable to prevent an attacker from getting in, but I am able to isolate any compromised asset and not allow the attacker to move on and prevent the damage, I've done my job. So the question is, how do we protect? And to better answer the question, I want to ask it differently. I want to ask, when does an attack fail? Because I just told you that in my previous life, we were successful in penetrating 100% of the time. But what I didn't tell you is that if we measure the success rate of our operation, the number would be much lower than that. It wasn't that low. We were still pretty much successful, but it wasn't 100%. And it's important to know that attacks do fail. So when does an attack fail? From my experience, attacks fail when they face what I call the ultimate defender. And the ultimate defender is someone that understands attack operation, have a lot of knowledge about the different tools and techniques. These people are capable in collecting data and analyzing it. And Maybe the most important part, these type of people are very curious and determined. This ultimate defender person will never go to sleep at night if she feels something is wrong, something is weird, something is suspicious. And they will not do it before because they're loyal to their employee. They are. They want to impress their boss, maybe. But they do it because, because they like it, because they like the thrill of it because they get excited when something put in front of them, a technological challenge. If you'll ask this type of person, what was the best day at your job, it will never be the day that nothing happened and we could drink beer and go to the beach. It will always be the day that something did happen and they were facing this technological challenge and they were playing a game against someone they never met before that was challenging them and they were not willing to lose this game. Personally, I remember the first attack we identified in cyberism. And I remember where I stood in the room. I remember the name of the compromised user. I remember the name of the compromised uh, file, or the malicious file, sorry. And I know exactly why or how the attacker lured the victim to execute this file. Because that's what makes me excited. And this is what I call hunting. And obviously, in our world, it doesn't look like that. It more looks like that. But cyber, defend, cyber defense hunting is about being proactive. It's about investigating our environment. It's about looking for the attacks before they appear in front of us. Because if we we'll wait 
for an attack to reveal itself, even if it does, it will be way too, la too late to prevent any damage. So we need to be proactive. And cyber defense hunting is what can move us from a strategy of prevent everything, that is a strategy that creates a asymmetric problem in cybersecurity because if we try to prevent everything, we need to be successful 100% of the time. Now let's say we have the best tools in the market and we can prevent 80% of the attacks. Or let's even believe the vendors and say that we can prevent 99% of the attacks. What it means is the attacker will try not once, but maybe 10 times or 100 times or even 1,000 times, but eventually they'll get in. But if we can change the strategy to what I call detect anything strategy, well, we need to detect something, some part of the attack, and then we can reveal the entire attack landscape and prevent the damage, then we're changing this equation and suddenly the asymmetric works for our favor because we need to succeed only once while the attacker needs to succeed 100% of the time in bypassing all the different detection, all the different tools that we have. So now we know we need to protect, we know how we need to do that, and we know what type of people we need to recruit to our teams in order to do that. But we still have a problem because there's a huge shortage in the professional manpower for this job. And I can show you numbers, but I, I would guess that all of you uh, feel it much better than myself. Uh, let me ask you, how many of you uh, uh, it takes you less than three months on average to recruit someone to your security team? Or how many of you currently do not have any open positions in your, for your advanced analysts or L3s? Okay. One hand here, one hand there. How many of you did not expand or try to expand your team in the last six months? So we are facing a very big problem in, in recruiting the right people to the right job. And this is a big problem in the United States and in Europe. It's even a bigger problem in Japan and the rest of Southeast Asia. And even in Israel, where I come from, which is considered a cyber hub, this is still a big problem. We cannot recruit the right people to all the positions we have in our sector. So the answer to a manpower shortage is, as always, technology. We are able, we are able to train a machine to be this ultimate defender. We train a machine to be the best security analyst just on steroids, because our machine does not have to sleep at night, they don't take any vacations, they work 24 seven, and I know some of you have this person in your teams, but let's be honest, and this person probably cannot communicate with human as good as a machine. Now, to build this technology, we need first the AI engine, the core of the technology. Then we, hit, we need to define the right behavioral models, and we need to train those models to differ between bad and, between, uh, bad and legit. And the outcome of this will be our ability to see more. So with this technology, we can now look at the entire attack landscape. We can understand more because we can implement behavioral-based detections and not rely only on the known indicators. And we can also stop more because we understand everything around the attack and we can stop it on time, or I like to call it the reverse IR. We respond before the incident. January 17, 2015. We got a phone call from a prospect saying they feel something is wrong. So we ask him, okay, what's wrong? And they say, mm, we don't really know, but something is. We took a moment to think and we, we, we decided, okay, we're not gonna proceed with the planned POC of deploying sensors to a few lab machines. Instead, we're gonna deploy our sensors to the entire organization. That, that was a 19,000 endpoint organization. 
And we decided to do this exercise, because back then we didn't really have the proper service as we do now. So we did an internal exercise. We took a team of about 10 of us, which was most of the company back then, and we divided to two teams, the research team and the development team. And the research team was responsible in raising the hypothesis, asking the questions, and then the development team was in charge of implement this, these uh, questions and ask them across the organization. So the research team focused on the more um, high profile assets, so the senior management of the organization and the active directory server. And then the development team implement and ask those questions across the organization. And we focused most of the questions about uh, the process object and the behavior of a process. Now a process is is what we call to this object that is created by the operating system when you run your MS Word. Okay, so the acting object is what we call a process, and it can be Word, it can be uh, um, a calculator or PowerShell, and every time you execute this process, this is a different instance of a process. Now, our engine is able to correlate between those processes and the activity, the behavior that they create. So the process to the uh, connection that it creates, to the models that it loads, to the DNS requests, um, and, and so on. And we ask questions like, is this process rare to the organization? Or is the fact that this process have an external connection is normal? For example, if you run a notepad and suddenly you see it connects to the external wall, that's probably suspicious. We ask if a process was executed from a signed or unsigned file, and if it's a signed, what was the authority that signed the file? And questions like if it was a shell process, was it executed manually or automatically, and, and so on. Our research team found a lot of abnormal behavior, but they couldn't really put their finger on something that was malicious. But once we implemented that across the organization, we found the smoking gun. And the smoking gun was a DLL, a suspicious DLL that was loaded to an OWA server. Now, OWA, this is Outlook Web Application Server. This is the way for uh, exchange organization to allow their users to connect to their mail from, from home. So the server allows external connection, but it's also connected to the Active Directory to authorize the credential of the user, meaning it kind of acts as a bridge between the external world and the internal organization. So a very lucrative target for an attacker. What we found is that the OWA process loaded two models with the same name. One of them was signed by Microsoft. And when we looked, we found it in other organizations as well, so we determined this one is legitimate. But the other one was not signed, it was executed from a very suspicious path. So we reverse engineered the file, and what we found is that this was a malware that was filtering every HTTP request received by the server, and if it saw a username and password in the request, it would store it to a file. Now, another part of the malware had uh, remote access capability where the attacker could remotely command the malware to do things like exfiltrating the stored credentials. We found the file where they stored the credentials, and we saw that 11,000 users were compromised. Now, out of the organization of 19,000 employees, that means that the organization was fully compromised. Lastly, we found the name of the targeted organization in parts of the code of the malware, which meant in no doubt that it was a targeted attack. It was our first in cyber research. What I learned from this exercise is that in order to face the emergent threats in cybersecurity, we need the accumulation of two. One, we need the technology that will allow us to ask the right questions and get the right answer. And second, we need the expertise to define those questions, to define those behavioral models 
that will allow us to reveal cyber attacks. And I, we took the exercise, and even today, we operate in a very similar way. So we have a research team in cyberism where um, the, this team is uh, composed of people with uh, a lot of technical experience in offensive operations, so they build offensive tools themselves, so they understand how the, what, what type of techniques can be used and how do you build an offensive tool. We have a team of defenders. This is part of our services team. These are people that are seeing attacks every day and have a lot of experience of how does an attack look like from the defender point of view. And we have a team of AI experts that are responsible to define the right models based on the input they get from the research teams. Now, what we build here is a technology that is getting more and more effective. So cyberism today is better than what we had a year ago. And that's a crucial differentiator between the current technologies and the previous one, because with previous technologies, they were very, very effective at first. But their effectiveness was reduced over time because attackers learned how to bypass antiviruses and sandboxes. With AI technology, we have the infrastructure to add more and more capabilities, more and more behavioral models to improve our ability to, to detect and to prevent and to stop. And this is why we think about this technology as a future-proof approach. Because we have the capability to stop attacks today, but also tomorrow. So I really hope you enjoyed this session, whether you did or did not. There are five things I want you to remember. First, we are going to win. No doubt about it. We'll win because we'll understand that the penetration phase in, is inevitable, but our goal is to protect organizations. We can really protect our organization if we can see more, understand more, and stop more. And we'll have very good chance of doing so if we'll use AI technology. Thank you very much.